Good morning, Oklahoma. I'm Curtis Hare, and welcome to SunUp. As our corn and sorghum crops start to grow taller, the look of these plants can show us how healthy they are. OSU Extension Soil Nutrient Specialist Dr. Brian Arnall tells us how to identify what nutrients these plants are deficient in. We're getting at the stage of the corn crop and sorghum crop where we're kind of running out of time to do anything nutrient-wise but it is a good chance to walk your fields and get an idea if you might have some potential problems that you can take care of in the future. And while we always recommend soil testing and the use of tissue testing in good and bad spots, you can use a plant to let you know how it's doing in the season. So I wanted to walk through some of the more simplistic ways to do some uh, checking on nutrient analysis. And first we're going to start with this corn plant here that I've pulled and you got to think about the corn plant as two different sections. Actually, all plants as two different sections. You have old growth down here on the corn plant, so these old leaves, and then you have the new growth up top. And I talk about old growth and new growth because nutrients inside the plant are mobile. So not only are they mobile in the soil, nitrogen is mobile and phosphorus is not, there's nutrients that are mobile and immobile in the plant. We have four nutrients that are mobile in the plant, meaning that when the plant runs out, the roots can't find anymore, it's going to translocate up to the top and remove it from older growth. And then the rest of the nutrients are uh, immobile, meaning when the plant starts running out, you see the nutrient deficiencies up top. And so we're going to first start with the mobile nutrients. That's nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and magnesium. So those four are the ones we find on old growth. The first we're going to start with is nitrogen. And this is a perfect leaf of nitrogen. So it's old growth. You see that the tip is turning yellow and it's going towards the inner vein. So the, the middle vein is yellow and it's progressing towards the outer tip. This is the perfect nitrogen deficiency. Now phosphorus, so we don't have phosphorus deficiency, but same. Phosphorus is easy to pick up because you'll have purpling. These lower leaves will be purple and you're gonna start with your older growth and work the way up. Potassium is is a, a easy one. It's much like nitrogen that it's yellow and corrosive, but instead of nitrogen starting on the tip and progressing into the middle, potassium starts along the outer edge as yellow and the middle is green. Now magnesium, and it will be typically, you see magnesium, it has called intervenal corrosive, which means there's yellow lines we're getting pretty late for everything. We could potentially put some nitrogen on right now if we had the right application or irrigation and recover from some nitrogen stress at this point. Now, if you see some interesting colors and shapes developing on your upper leaves, that's gonna be your immobile nutrients. One of the first two I've seen quite a bit of this year is sulfur. So that's gonna be a general yellowing of this new growth. So in this plant right here, it's really easy to see that we have some yellowing down here, but our new growth is fairly green. If we had sulfur deficiency, this newest leaf right here would be a pale yellow. Now, in early stages, we can apply sulfur. It's a mobile nutrient in the soil, so we can apply sulfur and recover. We have a soil fertility handbook that's got some nice pictures of nutrient deficiencies, along with some other fact sheets and websites that'll be useful. Check out the sunup.okstate.edu website for more information. Hi, Wes Lee with the weekly Mesonet Weather Report. Anytime we can get rain in the summer months, it is a welcome sight. This five-day map from Wednesday shows that as a strong summertime cold front moved through the state, it created a widespread rainfall event. The northwest tier of counties received a very beneficial rain of near one inch, as did sections of central Oklahoma. Salisaw had the highest amount with 1.36 inches. This rain helped out with soil moisture in a few western counties, but we still have quite a bit of moisture depleted soils. The commonly summertime dry areas of the southwest, northwest, and panhandle show up as red on this 10-inch fractional water index map. Soil moisture is still very good at most eastern mesonet sites. The cold front, although not long-lasting, was a strong one that dropped temperatures statewide. 
Tuesday morning lows were well below the level considered normal for this time of year, being in the 50s across most of the state. Afternoon highs on that day were also well below normal, apart from Texas and Cimarron counties. The normal statewide average high temperature for June 22nd should be around 91 degrees. A similar cold front is expected to reach the state this weekend, again dropping temperatures and giving us another decent chance at rain. Now here's Gary with details on the drought starting to expand again. Thanks Wes and good morning everyone. Well was that rainfall that Wes showed us enough to help the drought monitor? Let's take a look at the latest map and see where we're at. Well, I'm afraid the map actually got a little bit worse. We now have moderate drought in Woodward County. Uh, so that was an area that was just abnormally dry. Now it does have drought uh, centered in it. Uh, and then we have that moderate to severe drought from southwestern up into central Oklahoma. And then the yellow areas are, again, signifying areas of abnormally dry conditions that are possibly going into drought without some significant rainfall coming up. Here's the reason for the drought in those two regions. If we look at that area in the northwest Oklahoma, and then the area from southwest up into central Oklahoma. Those are areas that have only received since uh, March 1st about six to seven to eight inches of rainfall. So definitely uh, not enough rainfall in those regions. That's for the growing season to date. Uh, the long-term deficits are starting to build in those regions. They've continually missed the rainfall. We're gonna get some help with temperatures at least as we look at the climate outlooks from the Climate Prediction Center for the June 29th through the July 3rd period and also the July 1st through the July 7th period, we do see uh, increased odds of below normal temperatures uh, for that time frame, uh, especially in that earlier period. So definitely a milder start to the mid parts of summer as we get into July. That will definitely help uh, at least lessen the chances of that evaporation worsening the drought uh, at least too much uh, compared to normal. So we are just now exiting the rainy part of the year. Now we're entering the long, hot summer. We can still get some rain, so let's hope we get some showers and storms in those particular regions in the northwest and also from southwest up into central Oklahoma and help that drought outlook. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Well, Fourth of July is just about a week away, and John, what are some things that people need to think about in regards to lighting off fireworks and the implications that could have for like a wildfire? You know, you, you think you think about wildfires a lot of times Fourth of July. You know, too, if, if you do look at a bunch of the data that we've looked at over the years, Fourth of July is actually the number one wildfire day, and it's because you got a lot of ignition sources going on out there. But it's also going to depend on the year. The things that you should think about, especially with firing aerial fireworks, you know, the ones that go up, up in the air and explode off, think about what are they exploding over? Uh, you know, is it dry fuel? Is it harvested, unharvested wheat stubble? You know, take precautions, fire them a different direction. Also think about the wind direction that's blowing that night, where the embers or sparks are gonna go, cause that'll carry them a little ways and, and get things going on. The other thing to think about, you know, again, as you're firing and, and you've got stuff collected there, it's good to have a container to put those in. Uh, a lot of times a metal container. So again, in case they catch on fire, you know, it's not gonna burn anything up, but it's also good just to have a Bucket of, bucket of water that you can dip them in and that way that you'll soak them make sure everything's out and there, there's not any kind of problems also it may be good if you've got some concerns and things like that to have some kind of you know something to fight fire with you know a bucket a couple of buckets of water to put things out with or do whatever you need to do you know that's a good point about uh you know wheat stubble out in the pasture that's that's really dried down and that probably goes to, to really think about wildfire regardless of what time, like 4th of July or not. That's right. You know, again, any, again, you know, we're still doing things during the summer. You know, we're, we're setting corner posts, we're, we're welding on corrals, doing all kinds of things with things that start embers and things like that. Also, hay baling's coming. You know, people are baling hay, more, more hay baling will be going on. You know, there's always those things that can start fires and do that. So we should always kind of just think just a little bit, you know, just a little bit of prevention will go a long ways. If you think about it before you get started, think about, you know, check the weather real quick. What, what direction is the wind blowing today? Is the wind going to be blowing a lot stronger than you thought it was? You know, check that forecast. So in case the fire does get started, you know, those stronger winds will fan it and carry it a lot further and, you know, be problems like that. Um, you know, also again, think about where you're working around. Uh, also, you know, you may want to mow an area 
to work in or to work around so that way in case something does ignite it's in short fuel really short that you've got mowed down so it'd be easier to extinguish and, and to put out same thing with with fireworks you know make sure you mow you down an area or somewhere that you're going to do your fireworks and that way the 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 fuels there aren't aren't very big and and then the probability of something catching on fire is not much and if even if it does it'd be simple to to extinguish so you know moving forward you know that's wildfire we're, we're in july right now we still got you know a couple more months of like the hot weather how does late summer burning prescribed fire uh shaping up to be for this year uh it's it's really good you know again we've got a lot of older growth from from the previous year and stuff and it's it's burning well we've actually did a few burns in the last couple of weeks and they're burning really well and i know other people that's has still been doing some burning and stuff and, and everything's looking really good uh with that and again as we get further on in the summer it's just going to probably get on better you know again we're just going to have to watch the forecast and stuff if you know if it turns off really really dry you know that's when things get a little more uh, you know a little more risk involved with some of that stuff but you know again as this summer's shaping up it looks really good all righty thanks john john weir fire ecologist here at oklahoma state university we're out here this morning talking pond management with our specialist Marley Beam. And Marley, we've had a lot of uh, rain in the past uh, month or so. Uh, how has that kind of uh, affected ponds? What should uh, landowners be thinking of? This is the time to be looking for any signs of erosion. I'd pay a special attention to your spillways, the overflow that's around the side of your dam. Uh, that's typically going to be earthen. Anytime you see any erosion there, I would get after it right away. That could be the start of a serious head cut. You've maybe seen serious head cuts before, but if not, you don't want to be dealing with it after it's bigger than dump truck and you've got to bring in loads and loads of material to fill it up. So get it filled and revegetated as soon as you can. I'd also be looking at the dams just for any, any surface uh, erosion. That may not be uh, maybe going on all the time, but we'd like to see it well vegetated. We'd like to not have bare and eroding uh, tracks from cattle uh, on that surface uh, so that's vulnerable also so now that things are growing uh, let's try to get things revegetated and do what we can to prevent uh, serious problems down the road and now that things are heating up uh, things like uh, pond weeds and pond vegetation are obviously beginning to bloom more uh, what kind of management tips do you have for uh, landowners who kind of want a cleaner pond right well, it, everybody has a different opinion on what clean is, but I, I'd like to encourage people to see the benefits of having some aquatic plants. About 20 to 30 percent coverage is ideal for the fish. Uh, it also helps uh, minimize or eliminate the chance of wave erosion uh, of your dam or your shorelines. So, uh, but if you're getting more than that, if you're getting an excessive amount, if it's increasing year to year, please uh, talk about uh, getting it identified at your county extension office and coming up with some control measures for it. If you can bring in a fresh sample and or a photo taken from about 12 inches away of just a single plant, they should be able to fix you up with an uh, identification of that plant. And that's what we really need because we really want to know what it is before we begin to try to match you up with an appropriate herbicide if that's what looks like uh, would be suitable or desirable for you. And uh, you also have a new fact sheet out about uh, building ponds. That's right. Building a pond is something that uh, everybody needs to know more about. Even if you've already got a pond, it's good to know how ponds work and what the different structures are all about so you can keep an eye on them and appreciate them. People are building, whether you're building a pond or not, you need to know about things like the width of the, the top width of the dam and the slopes on the dam and why those are areas you might want to invest some extra money in to avoid problems down the line. You also have another new fact sheet uh, about how copper sulfates can uh, help prevent algae buildup. Tell us a bit about that. Right. Copper sulfate is uh, probably our cheapest aquatic herbicide, but it has limitations. We have to be careful with it and not uh, rely on it too much, especially when it comes to algae. Algae are very adaptable and they tend to pop back right away. So typically uh, uh, we, we may want to hit it with some copper sulfate as long as we don't have sheep or goats around. But uh, we do want to be careful with it uh, that, to not over rely on it because we're going to get frustrated because Algae will beat us every time. It just keeps coming back. We've got to look at some other strategies in, in those cases, whether it's filamentous algae in the slimy mats or the planktonic algae that just gives us a pea, uh, pea green uh, soup kind of appearance to the water. Uh, we need to try to look at nutrient sources, and in some cases we can do some things to reduce light levels in the pond. All right, thank you, Dr. Beam.
And for more information on the fact sheets that he mentioned, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Well, we're a little bit more than halfway finished with wheat harvest. So Kim, how is harvest progressing throughout the state? It's progressing relatively well. I think the best information about the wheat harvest is with the Oklahoma Wheat Commission on their web page is where you can find that. Uh, the yields, I think they're good to excellent, above expectations. Test weight, mostly above 60 pounds. That's a good number one uh, hard red winter wheat. Uh, you look at protein, a little below average at 11.1%. Our hard red winter wheat harvest is all the way to the Kansas-Oklahoma border and some cutting up into central Kansas, but that's limited a little bit. And if you go all the way up into the Dakotas, of course, there's problems with that uh, spring wheat up there with the drought. So shifting out to the world for the 2021-22 wheat crop, how is that progressing? Well, you, we probably got over 40% of the 2021 world wheat crop harvested. Uh, it's coming in a, uh, above expectations. The uh, latest estimate is 29.2 billion bushels. You can compare that to 28.5 billion bushel record last year. Uh, you look at the Black Sea area, that's Russia, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan. 4.8 billion bushels compared to 4.6 billion last year and an average of around 4.4 billion bushels. Australia is expected to harvest their second good crop in a row. You've got problems up in say North Dakota and into Canada with drought up there and probably reduced uh, expected production in those areas. So shifting to the grain markets, you know, last week when we talked to you, the, was, there was a lot of volatility. Now is that volatile streak continuing? It's still volatile. Uh, you look at uh, corn and soybeans over the last two weeks, you've lost 90 cents in corn and you've lost a dollar and 60 cents in, in soybeans. Looking at the wheats, hard red winter wheat since uh, early May is down a dollar and 20 cents. Soft red winter wheat is down a dollar and your spring wheat are around 20 cents. So you see the other grains not as falling or the other wheats not falling as much as hard red winter wheat. Looking at those spreads, Soft red winter wheat has a 45 cent premium to hard red winter wheat now, and spring wheat has a dollar and 80 cent premium to hard red winter wheat. Wow, there's a lot going on. So, like, why, why have prices been so volatile? Well, if you look at corn and soybeans, they're relatively tight uh, supplies, especially with soybeans. There's some uncertainty about how many acres have been planted. We have a report coming out this next week. There, uh, the market's expecting them to increase those acres, which would increase the production. Uh, you look at, uh, at wheat, our, our, I think our yields are a little higher than expected. Uh, hard, U.S. hard red winter wheat coming in higher than expected. That puts some pressure on prices. Corn prices going down, that put pressure on wheat prices. However, early in the year, there was a lot, billions of dollars in, in, entering the commodity markets. That, mar that money has been moving out of the grains, and as that money moves out of the grains, there's less uh, purchases there, and prices have went down. So, you know, for the past few weeks, there's just been so many changes, and, you know, we keep asking you, what should producers do to take advantage of these changes? And, and what, what would you offer, what, what advice would you offer to them now? Well, you look at history, uh, right now you can sell wheat about $5.90. The five-year average for June, July, and August is $5.60, so we're a little above that. Last year, this time, it was $4.10. You look at corn, you can forward contract for $5.20. The average over the last five years has been $4.10, so you're well above average corn prices. It was $3.30 this time last year. Soybeans, $12.30 for a forward contract. $9.70 five-year average. This time last year it was $8. So you've got relatively good prices. I'd, I'd take advantage of some with wheat. There's some long-range forecast that these prices are going to hold over the next few years. I would sell some wheat. I may store some into July and August just to see what happens. But we've got a relatively good price still. All righty, Kim. Kim Anderson, Crop Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Good morning, Oklahoma, and welcome to Cow Calf Corner this week. We are joined this week to talk about flies by Dr. Justin Talley. Uh, it's been an interesting spring in Oklahoma. I think a lot of us in the cattle business were optimistic after that cold weather in February. 
that we might see some reduced insect load as we came into the spring and summer and that's really not proven to be the case and Dr. Talley is going to explain a little bit more about how and why that works. Justin, tell us about flies. Yeah, Mark, when we think about flies, you know, Oklahoma is in that ideal area that we, we're going to get a significant fly population, really regardless of what's going to happen in the winter because our springtime temperatures and, e and even our summertime temperatures are always conducive for fly development. And as you go further east into Oklahoma, we have humidity levels that are going to be just ideal for both ticks and flies, but specifically this year for flies. Uh, our two main flies this time of year are horn flies and stable flies. Stable flies uh, typically come in in the spring and then taper off in the summer and then come back in the fall. Uh, they're kind of a cooler season type fly and they're all coming from our old hay feeding areas. So all the hay we fed during that really cold uh, time period uh, during the winter, if there's still old hay residue that's out there, it's harboring stable flies. And then when we think about our most important external parasite of beef systems, it's, it's the horn fly. And the horn fly is a small fly that feeds on the back, down the side, to the underside of the animals. And they'll feed on calves, they'll feed on cows, they'll feed on bulls, and all, all, every, every part of the beef system the, the horn fly prefers. And their feed, they're developing in the fresh manure pats. And so out in the middle of the pasture, and that's why uh, some of our technologies that you can administer through a mineral like an IGR, they're still really good technologies and it's a really great way to suppress your overall horn fly population. But overall, horn flies have the biggest impact. What can we do? I mean, in a lot of cases we have ran out of places to spread manure. We're, we're still dealing with some of those. What what could be done with any of those to potentially dry them out? Yeah, so when we think about hay feeding areas, you want to just be able to kind of get under that initial hay layer. Once you get under that hay layer, uh, disturb it, allow it to dry out, that's going to be the best thing to reduce our stable fly population. And so typically what we try to recommend is if you drag some kind of implement through those areas and just drag it through there until you probably see a little bit of soil. And once you see the soil, you know you've gotten to that, that moisture layer where the stable flies could be developing. So you essentially go out there, uh, drag something through it so it'll dry out. And then for horn flies, our number one type of application are porons because they're easy to use and they're, they're already uh, uh, formulated to put directly on the animal. Uh, the challenge with that though is that those are only going to give us about three weeks at most. Another thing for horn flies are ear tags. And when we think about ear tags, it's resistance that we have to really address. So when we think about insecticide ear tags, it's all about rotating and um, it's a year to year rotation. So you put that in. We determined that if you tag cattle in Oklahoma mid-May to mid-June, that's probably your optimal time period to get an ear tag in. Because in Oklahoma, our fly season is, is, seems to be getting longer and more intense. Whereas, you know, our peak flies were always occurring in August, and, but our, it seems like our season keeps getting later and later. So we still have a significant amount of flies on cattle in September. So if you can wait till that, that, that late May or June period to put an ear tag in, it's gonna provide that control for you up into those critical months such as uh, August and September. Well, Justin, I appreciate you joining us this week. Good talking to you, and thank you all for joining us on Cow Calf Corner. Here I'm standing in front of poison hemlock. Poison hemlock is one of the most toxic plants we have here in Oklahoma and is spread across the state. The only counties you might not find this plant is in the panhandle. It's toxic to many livestock species, but more importantly, it's also really toxic to humans. Even by just touching this plant, you can, have to, you can become really, really sick. So this is a plant that you don't want to touch and you definitely do not want to eat. For livestock and wildlife that consume this plant, they can sometimes die within 20 minutes. And it doesn't take very much. Less than 500 grams of this plant can actually kill an animal. You might see this plant growing in your flower beds. It might be growing in wooded areas or um, in the edge of your property. You really need to be very, very careful when around this plant. This plant has white flowers and they're kind of umbrella shaped. The leaves kind of look like a fern and they have deep, deep lobing. 
You can tell this plant apart from some of the other white flowering plants that grow at this time of the year because of its really, really tall height. This plant will grow six to 10 feet tall, as you can see behind me. So another important characteristic that you can look for to help identify poison hemlock is the red spotting that you'll find on the stem. This plant gets really, really large, and the stems are big, and they have all these little red dots along them, and you can see these really, really well, especially earlier in the season when the stems are really green. So that can help you to identify it and um, is different from many of the other white flowering plants that we have. To manage this plant, you really don't want to do anything where you're touching it. And even if you do spray it with herbicide, herbicides can increase the palatability of this plant. So if it's in a pasture where livestock are grazing, that might not be the best option unless you can keep the livestock out for a length of time after you've sprayed it. In addition, the stalks remain toxic for up to three years. So you really want to try to make sure that you remove any of the above ground um, growth after you've done any kind of herbicide treatment. One option for controlling this plant is after you've done a herbicide spray, it's to do a prescribed burn in that pasture to try to remove all of the above ground material so you won't have any animals that potentially graze it. Another thing that you can consider is not using heavy stocking rates and not using rotational grazing systems that have high stock densities where animals are forced to consume plants that they don't want to eat. These can help to limit the chances of your livestock eating this plant accidentally. You know, when we think about problem plants in our yards and in our pasture, we think about plants that might give us a rash, like poison ivy or um, bull nettle. But when we talk about plants like this, this can actually kill you. And even just by touching it, it can really make you sick. If you have questions about a plant that you think might be poison hemlock, take pictures of it and take it to your county extension office so they can help you to identify it. And that about does it for us today. Remember you can find us online at sunup.okstate.edu and follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Curtis Hare, and remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.